So hey guys, um, I'm super excited to be able to sit down and chat with Dr. Ken Brown tonight. Um, and just a little background on Dr. Brown. Uh, he received his medical degree from the University of Nebraska Medical School and completed a fellowship in gastroenterology um, in San Antonio, Texas. He's a board certified gastroenterologist and has been in practice for over 15 years. Um, his main focuses are inflammatory bowel disease and irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. And this is one of the really cool things I, I love about Dr. Brown is he, he's declared that his mission is to bridge the gap between medical and natural science, which is amazing. Um, we need more of that in the world. Um, so, and then he's also created a, a new product called Autron Teal. So we'll dive a little bit into that in this interview and kind of what we're going to do is go over, you know, methane, SIBO, the difference between hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide and methane, and then kind of talk about his products. So um, I'd love to introduce you to Dr. Brown. <laughs> Josh, thank you so much. It's my honor to be on your show and uh, thank you for developing a site, SIBO Survivor, to help a lot of these people that are really searching for answers. Yeah, definitely. So I think first off, um, is there anything else you'd kind of like to add about your background? Maybe, um, I don't know, how you got interested in IBS and SIBO and kind of dove into this world? Well, I um, the beauty of being a gastroenterologist is that I truly believe that all health begins and ends in the gut. Yeah. So it's really the only specialty in medicine where I can do a really cerebral component where you try and figure things out. And then I do, well, I essentially play video games in people's intestines where I can cut out colon polyps and save lives. So it's yeah. a perfect, perfect marriage there. As I was doing uh, my internal medicine and then followed by my gastroenterology fellowship, you start realizing that there's this clump of symptoms that we call functional medicine symptoms or, or they call them functional diseases actually. And it, most of traditional medicine, they just put a stamp on it, and it's like a trash can diagnosis. Irritable bowel syndrome is one of them, functional dyspepsia is one of them, fibromyalgia. And it always bothered me that we had this group of diseases that we just would give up on. And that's when my interest started in clinical research. So I started doing clinical research for the pharma industry. I had a, uh, I had a whole department of clinical research. And that's when I started realizing that the, we can't rely on the pharmaceutical industry to keep developing molecules or, or products for us in the hopes that it can help. And that sort of started my whole passion towards finding something to help this disease process known as irritable bowel syndrome. And that's where my passion really came up about 15 years ago. Awesome. That's super cool. And I love, I love the point you made about like kind of it. IBS being kind of a trash can diagnosis and kind of for me as a patient who was diagnosed with it and still kind of deals with some gut issues, uh, I'd, I'd say that's one of the most frustrating things is the, just the, the vague diagnosis, right? It's like, okay, you have IBS and like, what does that mean, right? So, but I think like what we'll kind of dive into in our interview is, you know, some more research that's been going on um, about SIBO and how that relates to IBS and... I think it's cool because we're hopefully moving in a direction where, you know, we can get more specific, um, you know, what kind of IBS the person has and then what, what's causing that, right? Like whether it's the microbiological issue or, you know, motility disorder and we're kind of being able to, you know, pinpoint things better now, which is good. So, um, I guess first I want to talk about um, the different types of, of SIBO and how, how that kind of plays a role in IBS. So are you able to go over the difference between um, like hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide? Sure. Let me back up just a quick yeah. step and describe. So when we're talking about irritable bowel and then we're throwing out this word SIBO, probably most of your listeners already understand the connection between it. But it is essentially what's happened is this paradigm shift that has taken place that is very similar to 30 years ago when we thought that stress was causing ulcers and we discovered that it was actually due to a bacteria called H. pylori. Mm -hmm. Now we realize that something happens, you get an infection, take antibiotics, go through a stressful situation. It just shocks your small intestine and then bacteria start to grow. So when the bacteria grow, they break down the food before you can and then they're going to release certain gases, one of them being hydrogen. 
And that's the primary gas that actually gets released. So imagine the bacteria eating, let's say, a piece of bread, and as it breaks it down, hydrogen is released. And then if the other types of bacteria are around that are sulfur producers, then they can form hydrogen sulfide, or a type of bacteria called an archaeobacter can form methane. So that's kind of the model of where it went from IBS to now we're talking three different gases. Yeah. So the, the hydrogen gas is the backbone of all of this. So most bacteria will be able to produce hydrogen gas. So once the hydrogen accumulates enough, then that hydrogen can create bloating, do a lot of different things. But we know that it's not a static picture. We know that this is the multi-biome. you got a lot going on in your body. So that hydrogen, if it actually comes in contact with an archaeobacter, which is known as a methanogen, meaning they survive by producing methane, it will soak up the hydrogen and then through an enzymatic process, bind it to a carbon and it spits out methane. Yeah. So that's CH4 is methane. Mm -hmm. That methane actually works like a local paralytic, meaning it slows everything down. So you have this methane being produced, and imagine if you had a little sewer pipe, more methane is produced, and now you've got a bigger sewer pipe because it allows more bacteria to actually start growing. Yeah. That is the mechanism of irritable bowel syndrome slash C with constipation. Yeah. A quick side note, while I, was, while I was in training, it always bothered me that we would call something irritable bowel syndrome, and you could have diarrhea or constipation, yeah. which made no sense to me because those are opposing symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I always wrestled with that. Well, now we have a reason. Because if these bacteria break down the food, release the hydrogen, and then another type of bacteria produces sulfur, then you can develop hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Hydrogen sulfide, we now realize, actually causes diarrhea once the gas makes it to the colon. It's a promotility agent. Yeah. So there we have the hydrogen sulfide creating the diarrhea, the methane causing constipation. Those are the two main differences between the gases. Okay, got it. And then, so I think clarification for some people is... Um, can someone just have hydrogen? Because I know that maybe some people are kind of, kind of confused about that. So there's hydrogen sulfide, methane, and they both need hydrogen to produce those gases, correct? But can someone just have hydrogen producers and hydrogen gas or no? Yeah, you can have hydrogen producers, and that's how come we have this breath test that only measures hydrogen or methane. Yeah. Unfortunately, it does not measure, it, it does not measure uh, hydrogen sulfide. So it's a dynamic thing that's always going on. And it's something that my patients wrestle with where they're like, well, what kind of SIBO do I have? I'm like, that SIBO can change. Yeah. It is a fluid thing because you have bacteria which are adapting to the environment. So some people will be like, listen, I got sick a few years ago and I just, I never felt right. I get real bloated after I eat. And then out of nowhere, I started getting severely constipated. Hmm. Well, that's because the type the bacteria are opportunists. And they saw this environment, which had a hydrogen-rich environment, and the archaeobacter is going to come in and go, this is a lot of fuel for me. I'm going to live here. Suddenly, we've gone from bloated to bloated with constipation. Yeah. So it's, it's a fluid thing that's changing. Yeah. It's very interesting. And so do you ever see in, in patients where, like, maybe they'll switch from, um, you know, one type of gas predominantly to another? Like, because you're saying – like it's you're saying it's 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 fluid it changes right so like you can you know there, that's why there's the term mix too right some people can have both Correct. um yeah. but so so do you ever see what people like change um or that is a that is a great question because it's something that we started to see after we really started treating and curing people yeah we could see them shift from a diarrhea to a brief constipation state and then eventually back to normal. Yeah. And the only explanation that we could have is that we're changing the bacterial milieu that's happening in the small bowel. Yeah. We're actually affecting the ratios of these different things. I, I don't even think of it as so black and white. I'm going to call it the multibiome. It's yeah. not just bacteria. We've got fungal components which are contributing certain things to it. And all of this is affecting the motility. So we do actually see some people... I'll have patients that they'll say, hey, listen, I started taking Optron Teal, 
and my diarrhea is gone, but I'm actually constipated. Yeah. And I can tell them, okay, this is actually a good thing because now we know that we're affecting something. Yeah. We're going to make sure that you don't get too constipated. We're going to treat it a little bit, but I need you to power through this yeah. and see if we can you know, get to the other side. There's something called a die-off reaction, which can really affect both ways that people have things. When the bacteria die off, sometimes you can have like flu-like symptoms and you can have the opposite if you were diarrhea, you could have constipation. If you're constipation, you could have diarrhea. So it's this fascinating world that we're trying to live in their world, which is, you know, the bacterial world, yeah. and try to manipulate it. And sometimes it's not completely under our control. Yeah. And and I actually have experience as a patient kind of going through some of that, you know, die-off process when I did treatments and whatnot. So it's it's very interesting just the dynamics of, I guess, microbial change, right, when you're when you're doing something to the gut. It's really interesting. Um, it's yeah, it's absolutely fascinating because there's so many companies that are out there trying to figure out how to control the microbiome. It's, yes. That's the term everybody's using, microbiome. And it's hilarious because there's all this research that we're getting all we're certainly gathering an exponential amount of data and don't know what to do with it. Yeah, right? yeah. So we've got all these companies that are going. Well, we know a lot of answers lie in our microbiome. If you stop and think about it, we we have a genome within our genome and that's the hundred trillion bacteria that are in your colon. Yeah. And you know, I always, it's a saying that I, that I talk about when I lecture, which is you see a pregnant woman and say she's eating for two, we should be eating for a hundred trillion every yeah. single day. Yeah. If we feed our bacteria what they want and what they can do, yeah. the good bacteria yeah. and keep them in ratio. It's all about diversification. It's like a yeah. stock portfolio. Yeah, yeah. You want to make sure that you have a, a broad diversification of bacteria in your colon. And then we know that that works out better. All these companies are gathering data. You send your stool off to this company yeah. and I talk to patients and they're like, what do I do with this? I'm like, no one knows what to do with this. Yeah. We're all, we're all learning. Yeah. It's, it's still, it's still super complicated. And you know, in the infancy of research, right, we still are learning a ton about this. It is so exciting to be in the position that I'm in where we have um, like profound thought leaders. Um, Alessio Fasano is this guy who discovered, you know, who does a lot of research in celiac disease where you have a, an autoimmune reaction to wheat. And I heard him lecture about how the gut, the microbiome and intestinal permeability known as leaky gut may be the cause of the autism epidemic. Wow. And then I'm, and I'm at a different lecture where I've got a neurologist named David Perlmutter who wrote Grain Brain. Yeah. And he's showing data to show that, hey, the microbiome and intestinal permeability leaky gut could be the cause of Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah. So I've got these thought leaders that show cradle to grave. we got to start protecting ourselves. Yeah. So. It's, it's almost like it's, it's so important. It's kind of like, I don't know, to me, it seems like we kind of missed it in the past. It was kind of just something we didn't focus on as much. Maybe, maybe because we didn't have the advanced science like we do now, but, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Josh, let me go ahead and just talk about this. So yeah. the, one of the things, one of the reasons why I got into this is that this, one of the initial clinical studies I did was for a drug called Zyfaxin, yeah. which is the drug that was used to treat SIBO. Mm -hmm. I met Dr. Mark Pimentel, I mean, like at the very start of my career, and he had mouse models and rat models describing that irritable bowel is actually due to bacteria. Yeah. So I still have colleagues that do not believe that SIBO exists. Yeah. And yet I'm talking to the godfather of it who has it in a mouse model. And that's how we ended up developing Optron Teal, actually. It's because when I was talking with him, he said, you know, Ken, the problem is that we won't be able to help the bloated, constipated person. Yeah. Because our modern antibiotics do not affect this type of bacteria in its own kingdom called an archaeobacter. Yeah. So once I heard that, I was like, wow, well, what can actually help get rid of this archaeobacter? And that's that led our journey to try and develop a natural solution to that. Definitely. So when you say that we're just learning about it, I have colleagues who are still with their head in the sand, not even thinking about SIBO or, or leaky gut. Yeah. And they just say it just doesn't exist. You're just, um, you know, you're just depressed or you're anxious. Have this antidepressant. Yeah. And I'm vehemently opposed to that. So yeah. we really try and find reasons. Yeah, it's 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 super important. Um, so before we get into a little bit about more details on methane SIBO, I want to dive into. Um, let's just talk about the reason why SIBO occurs in the first place. Um, 
So I think this is an important topic because a lot of people, maybe they're familiar with SIBO or IBS, but actually understanding why they develop it is really important. Um, yeah. So I, I, I did go to your website, SIBO Survivor, and I did read about you, and your story is very, very classic. Yeah. This, is, this is what I hear all the time. So essentially, you can develop SIBO from a couple different reasons. Um, the main reason that we tend to see is that you can have an infection. Something sets it off. Yeah. A gastroenteritis. You go traveling, oh, I don't know, let's say Thailand or something, yeah. and maybe get a bad bug. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so if you're... If you go somewhere, you have a bad infection, you can recover from it, a certain percentage of people will develop a problem with the motility in their intestines, which will lead to bacteria growing. So yeah. that's one reason. Another one is that we take too many antibiotics. Yeah. We just destroy our normal microbiome when we mess with everything. So antibiotics can do it. And then ultimately stress can actually create some changes in, in the motility. I I see this all the time also where somebody goes through a very stressful situation. It's like insult to injury. They go yeah. through a divorce or a death in the family, and then their gut is really messed up. Yeah. And they'll even go one step further, and then they'll develop an autoimmune problem like colitis or Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final thing is our diet. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the Western diet is, is, is pretty rough on our guts. Yeah. And all three of those essentially can affect the motility, which then allows bacteria to start growing. So yeah. the key to this is what actually shocks our intestines. Yeah, definitely. And it seems it seems to me too, like just from talking with some other patients and whatnot, that a lot of people have a kind of a combination of these factors too, right? Like maybe they got gastroenteritis and they also took a lot of antibiotics when they're younger or something like that. So it's it's almost like some people are just set up to, you know, have issues with the function of their gut. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and they're, you know, the diet changes and the stress and then it becomes a vicious circle. And then yeah. the more that the bacteria grow, it's completely out of your control. And then the way that I tell my patients, if you can imagine a, a very crystal clear stream that's flowing yeah. and that's how it should function. Yeah. And then you block the front end and the back end and you trap that water there and it becomes like a little cesspool, like a little sewer pipe. Yeah. And once that happens, you have to be able to clear it out, let your normal motility come back in and go back to, a, you know, a crystal clear stream. So, yeah, definitely. Um, so now I just want to kind of dive into methane a little bit more. So um, can you maybe just give us an, a little overview? You kind of did a little bit already, but um, an overview of methane, SIBO, um, what the type of bugs that overgrow and then you know, symptoms and, and treatment methods that are related to this. Sure. So I don't want to geek out too much here, yeah. but <laughs> we learned about the methane producers um, really from, from animals. Yeah. So when you look at this, a ruminant, a cow, when they eat, they actually have to have some of these bacteria to help break down the fibers, the, the grasses that they eat. Well, one of them happens to be a bacteria that produces methane. Mm -hmm. And, it's known as a methanogen, yeah. and it's in its own kingdom. They're known as Archaebacter. So it's getting a little geeky here, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> the bottom line is we even know what type. It's a it's a M. smithi, hmm. methanobrevibacter smithi. So that's the, the genus and species. All you have to know is in the right environment, a type of bacteria will take that hydrogen and produce methane. And I always say type of bacteria because it is in its own kingdom, and modern day antibiotics do not affect these methanogens. And so that's the key to this, which is why people get so frustrated. They go to the doctor and even doctors that are a little knowledgeable about SIBO will put somebody on Zyfaxin, yeah. Rifaximin, and it really doesn't do a very good job against these Archaeobacter. What it can do is help get rid of some of the bacteria that's feeding it, but those Archaeobacter are still gonna sit there and thrive. Yeah. And what that methane does is it actually, as I mentioned, works as a local paralytic. So it slows everything down. Every time you eat, you blow up like a balloon, mm -hmm. and then only 20% of it gets absorbed. That means 80% goes to the colon, yeah. where it slows everything down, and now we have constipation. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest or most frustrating things that I see are my patients will come in and they'll be like, look, I've had this for about a year. I don't get it. I'm, I blow up like a balloon. I, 
and I'm eating less, and I'm gaining weight. Yeah. And methane actually does that also. The low-level inflammation and the fact that it slows everything down allows you to absorb more calories than you should. Yeah. So one of the consequences of all this is actually weight gain. It's super frustrating because yeah. you have people that are having um, both abdominal discomfort, they're gaining actual weight, and so you've got anxiety and things like that all going into play with it. So. Yeah, really, really fascinating. Um, and so you're saying that, you know, the antibiotics we have, um, they really don't affect these bugs as much. So, I mean, what, I, I know this is probably one of the harder cases to treat, right? So what do you, what are you usually trying and, and look at, or what do you, what is there to do right now for methane really? Well, that's actually why we developed Optron 2. Yeah. And this is where all the research actually started. And it actually came from the cattle. Mm -hmm. We were looking at when we were trying to look at this, my research manager at the time had done some policy writing for a senator in Iowa. Yeah. And they were looking at how to decrease methane production in cattle. And that's where the aha moment came in. So as soon as I had this aha moment, we I gathered up all that literature that had already been done on cattle. And we said, okay, what are the different ingredients that could actually stop this process? Yeah. And one of the ingredients is the quebracho. Nobody, um, nobody's ever seen that in a supplement before because it's a food source. Nobody had ever put it in a supplement. So yeah. that's how we got our patent is that we put three natural ingredients. So we know that the quebracho tree is a very ancient tree that has defense mechanism against archaeobacter and fungus. Yeah. So it can actually weaken the wall of the archaeobacter. And then... We put in um, horse chestnut conquer tree because it stops that enzyme that allows it to produce methane. So that's my go-to. And obviously, yeah. I did the research on it. We initially did it in very stubborn, very tough to treat um, IBSC yeah. patients. We got two published studies on that, one randomized, one where we treated people that had failed everything else. Yeah. And um, we had, you know, we four out of five, basically greater than 80% success rate on essentially relieving all symptoms. Yeah. So it is a very tough thing to treat, but it is something that you can fix. Many patients are very frustrated because they go to a couple doctors and the doctors treat with traditional antibiotics, and all that's doing is really disrupting your microbiome even worse and yeah. kind of taking two steps back instead of a step forward. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so that's really interesting how you kind of came up with a product um, looking at cattle, you said, right? And kind of... There, there had been some research done on, you know, um, inhibiting methane in cattle. Is that correct? Or? Correct. Yeah, that was actually, so that's probably what spent the next few years is just going through mountains of different studies, animal studies um, coming from different places. And we were able to put, we found one article where it really looked at the, at the polyphenols, which are in the peppermint. And yeah. we found some good anti uh, antimicrobial activity of that. Yeah. The peppermint that we put in, we keep it in whole leaf because we need those polyphenols, and we can talk about that in a little bit because yeah. I think that's a key component to where the future of all of this is going. Yeah. And then the um, we found these great articles on the cabracho, which is a large – cabracho is another polyphenol, so it's three polyphenols combined yeah. together to get rid of this. The cabracho is a very large polyphenol. Uh, known as a proanthocyanidin, which is a very large tannin. And the way that these molecules work, it's absolutely fascinating. You're going to see a ton of research coming out on this. I've been dealing with scientists all over the world, and I just love that everybody's everybody's using every, you know, in this information age, yeah. we can just springboard off the next person's research and go, oh, that's awesome, I'll do this. And I yeah. just love watching this take place because we're going to come – um, full circle, and I think the pendulum is going to start swinging back towards let's heal ourselves in the exact way that you want to do, which is we can use food and we can use yeah. natural products and really outperform, and that's where my whole mission of bridging the gap is coming in because exactly. I'm, I'm able to see both sides of the fence. So Yeah, and that's, uh, that, that gets me fired up, man. It's exciting just because, you know, if you can heal yourself with, you know, plants of the earth and the natural, you know, medicine, that's, that's what everyone wants, right? That's, that'd be amazing. So, Oh, it's not even what everyone wants. What I'm seeing in the industry, and yeah. remember I did uh, pharmaceutical research for many years. Yeah. And what you see is the big pharma will look at something and say, Oh, a great example is melatonin. Everybody's familiar with melatonin, helps you go to sleep, but works on your circadian rhythm. Yeah. Um, a pharmaceutical company came out with a melatonin extract of one molecule 
um, thinking, okay, we'll just concentrate this one and we'll yeah. synthetically make it, then we can yeah, get yeah. a patent on it. And it kind of came and went because it didn't really work. Mm-hmm. Not only didn't it not work, but basically the other molecules and natural melatonin um, prevented other side effects. Yeah. And so, you know, we're going to see that. All, I mean, it, it's the same thing. We're seeing it right now. Um, I'm doing a lot of research on cannabidiol, CBD, yeah. and there's a company that just got FDA approval to go forward with a cannabidiol isolate molecule that they got FDA approval on, so basically they're going to try and turn it into a drug. Yeah. But it's so myopic when you think about it because the phytocannabinoids, or the whole molecule, mm-hmm. does better than one molecule. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is we can never outperform Mother Nature if yeah. you're taking it the right way. Yeah. All these molecules come together. There's going to be a term, when I said polyphenol, polyphenols are these big, beautiful molecules that when they go to the colon, your colonic bacteria will break them down into beneficial products yeah. for you. So they work. That's what makes the Mediterranean diet an anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, anti-dementia type diet. And I was just speaking with a researcher. They're coining the term postbiotic. Yeah. So you've got prebiotic, probiotic. Wow, we got a we got a we got a new term coming in here. <laughs> I'm throwing a new term out there it's called postbiotic. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's so fascinating because now we realize that maybe we shouldn't be studying the poop yeah. itself and trying to find out the bacteria. Maybe we should be studying what the poop produces. Because yeah. that's the end game right there. So the term is postbiotic. Yeah. We do know that people that have um, a diverse, healthy diet with very colorful fruits, uh, the Mediter- I'm just going to keep throwing out the Mediterranean diet, but yeah. there's a lot of different diets that can actually accomplish that. We know that they have a more diverse microbiome, and that microbiome produces anti-aging, anti-cancer, and anti-inflammatory type molecules. Yeah, there it's so cool because there's even um, researchers are looking about how these polyphenols get broken down into a molecule called urolithin. Yeah, urolithin is a it causes mitophagy, meaning that the powerhouses in your cells, which are the mitochondria, mm-hmm. it tells aging and sick mitochondria, why don't you just go away? And let's allow the young guys to come up. Yeah, it's awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Because that means that basically you start getting sick and your body's like, you know, you need to, I think your job is done here. Let's, let's bring in some new healthy recruits. So, yeah. And that's, uh, that's why I keep throwing the term, uh, polyphenols, because that's why we, I don't want to say we stumbled, but by forming Optron Seal to get rid of SIBO, we're now seeing these beneficial effects that people are having where I had patients that would come to me and they're like, hey, my rosacea is gone. You're going to hear from a lot of a lot of your clients and a lot of people that follow you that after they get treated, they're going to say, hey, I don't know if this is coincidence, but ABC is better. Yeah. My arthritis is better. My yeah. thyroid improved. My rosacea got better. We know that the gut can be the root cause of these other inflammatory processes. Yeah, yeah. So- and I know that as a patient too, when, I, when I've when i you know dealt with, when I felt sicker, you know, um, it really does affect your whole body um, from your brain, like even your brain function, right? So like your thinking, um, your energy, all those things. It's amazing how much the gut affects your body. Um, it's um, when we get back to thinking about what the gut does, its job is to sample the outside world, decide what nutrients it needs and keep out any foreign invaders. Yeah. That tight junction meaning the, where the intestinal cells are together, is exquisitely complex and extremely important. Yeah. And when that becomes disrupted, that leads to leaky gut, which we now know is probably the cause of all autoimmune disease. Yeah. So once your intestine is compromised, not only did you have symptoms of SIBO, but if it went untreated, you could have potentially developed an autoimmune disease if it kept going unchecked. Yeah. Autoimmune meaning that your own immune system would attack your body. Got it. Got it. So it's yeah. really important. Yeah, it's it's super important. Um, so as far as 
So your your main go to with people with methane, a tron a trontil, and then do you use anything else or or, or just mainly you want to stick to that? I mean, well, so fortunately or unfortunately, yeah, I'm, um, I only tend to treat the people for third fourth opinions. Yeah, yeah, and uh, many times they failed my own product. Yeah, so and I. You know, and it's a moving target. Yeah. I'm not saying that, that this is uh, the end all be all. We do know that our clinical trials in the right person. So this is the key here, the right person. We yeah. found that so many people were desperate that everything became SIBO for a bit. It yeah. didn't matter what you had. Yeah. So we had people that were just gaining weight and they thought it was SIBO. They take it. Nothing happens. So if you eat specifically starchy foods and you blow up, mm -hmm. chances are clinically you have SIBO. Yeah. So I, when I have people that come into me and they've got classic symptoms and they've already tried Optron Teal at the recommended dose, which is two, three times a day for at least 20 days yeah. minimum. Some people need longer. And they go, no, I've been on it for months. It kind of helps, but I just can't get over it. Well, then the first thing I start doing is we really start realizing that four out of five people are going to get better. So are we missing something else? Yeah. So. I, I need to make sure nothing else is going on. And I've been kind of shocked at some of the unusual things that I have found. Um, cancers, which are in the small bowel. I have found the cold Crohn's disease and things. So then we take out all these people that actually have something. So now I'm left with this really tough to treat group that really yeah. seems like SIBO. Yeah. So I do. I do add other things. Yeah. I will take um, Optron Teal plus Zyfaxin. Yeah. I will even use, there was a study that came out which showed Zyfaxin plus Neomycin was better. Yeah. Um, I did that a lot before I ever used Optron Teal. So yeah. my results were kind of um, not that great on that. Okay. Um, from a natural perspective, yeah. we have found that Saccharomyces boulardii Interesting. plus Optron Teal. Yeah. Saccharomyces boulardii is a non-commensal yeast, meaning it's a yeast that isn't in us all the time like Canada. Yeah. So it does, and I met a naturopath in Australia. The person that actually figured this one out for me is um, is a great author named uh, Rob Wolf. He's a paleo kind of yeah, expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's a he's the one that took Optron Teal, started to have a die off reaction, took Saccharomyces. And realized that that really helped that. So I had to give credit to him. Then we started researching it. Then I started reaching out to naturopaths that had some experience with it. And one basically explained to me that it really helps with the IgA, which is the antibody in the lining of the intestines. Yeah. And it helps it helps your own body fight. So it produces this IgA immunoglobulin, which, which helps get rid of that. Yeah. And then the other thing, one of the reasons why I'm getting heavily into cannabidiol or CBD oil yeah. is because I have found that the CBD that we use, which has coconut oil in it, yeah. plus um, the full phytocannabinoid spectrum, mm -hmm. actually helps as well. So I'm, my big combo is Optrontil plus Saccharomyces plus minus CBD because it's got these medium chain triglycerides in there, which are really um, – they're – they're very helpful. They don't feed the bacteria. They kind of have an antimicrobial component also. Yeah. So. Very cool. And so, real, real quick, what does the CBD help with? I'm not as familiar with the effects of that, really. So CBD, and I never would have discovered it had I not sort of been in this world where I go to these natural meetings and functional medicine yeah. meetings. And uh, when I talk to my colleagues, they're, I mean, they have yet, they're just barely wrapping their head around SIBO, let alone a natural treatment for SIBO, let alone something else. So yeah. cannabidiol, um, we have in our systems, the endocannabinoid system. Yeah. And it's got a, it's a big fancy name. Um, ECS is the acronym, but so this was discovered somewhere around 27 years ago or so. And it's a system that's in both our nerves and our immune. Yeah. So it's almost like if I would have gone to medical school and I would have uh, completely skipped over the cardiovascular uh, system to study. We now realize it's a very important system. It's found in essentially all vertebrates. And I started and I'm, I'm new to the research on this, but I'm really doing a deep dive because I'm having so much success getting rid of uh, bacterial overgrowth, feeding these polyphenols, and then using CBD to help my Crohn's and colitis patients. Yeah. That I have a moral obligation to continue down this path and figure out exactly why. Yeah. And the more that I get into it and talk to scientists, they can really, there's so much science on this, it's cool. Yeah. So what the CBD does is, if you can imagine this, 
Um, a really simplistic way is that you have the presynaptic neuron. So all nerves have a presynapse and a postsynapse. Mm -hmm. Um, and it fires all these neurotransmitters. And so you can imagine if you've got, you know, a ton of anxiety or ADHD or even seizures, because that's a hyper, um, that's like the most extreme version of it. It's the only molecule that lives on the postsynaptic side. And your body makes your own CBD called endocannabinoids. Okay. And all it does is just go, whoa, chill out. We need to reset back to normal because we've got too much down downhill slide so yeah. in the gut it does the same thing with the immune cells it's like whoa you're just overreacting a little so with me being able to combine it um that's where i'm having a lot of the success with the optron teal getting rid of the bacteria feeding your back feeding your good bacteria and the cbd sort of getting everything let's just reset back to normal yeah gotcha i think it's really interesting, kind of one of the key takeaways for me just from talking to you is just the synergistic effects of, you know, whether it's herbs or using different things, right? Because it's kind of like you're talking about, like, if you isolate one compound, you're getting rid of, like, the other things that were naturally in that substance, right? That, that have an effect, even if it's a small effect on your body. So it's really interesting. Oh, absolutely. I was in Spain last summer and... Um... I'm walking around, it seemed like everybody still smoked and they yeah. eat what they want for breakfast, you know, cured meats and bread and they yeah. eat dinner late at night and wine with every meal. And, um, you know, they're not obsessing about their health. And yeah. I come back and I did, a, I looked at the census. We have more diabetes, more dementia, more cardiovascular disease, and they outlive us. Why? And I was looking at the diet. Everybody says, oh, it's the diet. Yes, it, there probably is quite a bit going on with the way that we raise our grains here and the yeah. way they do. But they also eat like 10 times the amount of polyphenols that we do. It's just a normal part of their diet. Yeah. They eat colorful foods. Yeah. So um, I always, I'm becoming obsessed with that also where even though I got a natural product, I really don't think that any supplement will outperform a, a diet that you give your body and your body will decide what it needs. Yeah. And so that's um, the reason why the CBD, you have to use a full phytocannabinoid spectrum with with all the other flat, um, flavonoids in it and terpenes in it, because your body will decide what it needs, and it'll once it has enough, it says, oh, you know, we're we're back to balance. Yeah. So, my recommendation is make every meal as colorful as possible. Yeah. If it's a colorful plate, you're probably getting a lot of really good stuff in there. Yeah. So. Definitely. Um, I think you know, so important and. You know, with people who have SIBO or IBS, I think just being able to get to that point too, right, is really important for their health to where they can tolerate that diversity, right? Um, Absolutely. So one of the problems that I see a whole lot is that people start food restricting. I don't yes. know if you did that during your health journey. Yeah. But I, have ex I have experience with it and I had – when I did a super restricted diet, I actually it actually made me worse I found in the long term. So I kind of – I've kind of branched out and I'm much more diverse now, but it, like I lost weight. Um, I got weaker. It was, I, I, for me, it wasn't good getting too strict. So, well, it's, I mean, in your, in your zeal to fix your gut, yeah. you can end up becoming malnourished in other ways yeah. because you start restricting so much. People have, you know, they'll say, well, I had a reaction to that. So I'm not going to eat that anymore. I had a reaction to that. I'm not going to eat that. By the time they come to me, I'm checking their blood values, and they've got micronutrient deficiency. Now we've got other problems going yeah. on. They're anemic. Their B12 is low. All kinds of stuff. So yeah. you're exactly right. You have to make sure that you continue to eat healthy, but it can make you feel worse in the beginning. And yeah. then ultimately, in the end, the outcome is much worse if you food restrict too much. Definitely. So just to kind of round up here on, on, on methane um, – what do you see as the future of, you know, is there any new research going into the methane producers and, and any new, you know, you know, whether it's drugs or, you know, anything to kind of help the methane issue besides like your product is awesome, seems like. Um, but what's what's kind of the state of that? <laughs> so um, to give Dr. Pimentel props, yeah. um, he's continued to do research this whole time. And he's actually um, about ready. I think he's in phase three trials right now with something that is called SIN01 
O until they figure out a pharmaceutical name for yeah, it. Yeah. But it, it is basically a non-absorbed statin that is specifically developed to decrease methane production in the colon. Okay. So it doesn't get absorbed, it does it in the colon. And the reason why is we now realize that maybe not all of this, the symptoms are really from SIBO, you eat, you bloat. Yeah. But you may have a overgrowth of these methane producers in the colon. Yeah. So they just keep showing back up. And by having too much methane floating around in the colon, because um, we've been focusing on the small bowel, and now we realize, oh, well, maybe there's a little bit extra in the colon. So yeah. he's coming out with something where I think the one-two punch of maybe I'm trying to see on the small bowel and something that gets all the way to the colon and decreases the amount of methane uh, producing there may actually be kind of a more of a game changer to bring that back. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like it seems like the more we learn, the more we learn it's how complicated it is, right? Because like at first we didn't realize maybe it was had an, it was also an issue in the colon, right? So it's really really fascinating. Oh, I yeah, I think it's so cool and so humbling. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, as, as I'm going down this journey, you know, I had, I was, you know, very focused on this one thing. And then I start meeting people. I just had a call. Um, I forgot to mention something that I have, I don't have a whole lot of experience with, but I had a great time talking to the CEO. I've always, so one of the problems that I've had is, is that many times people will come in and they feel worse on probiotics. Yeah. Probiotics. If you think about it, if you have a lot of bacteria growing in your small bowel and you take live bacteria. Yeah. Although we know that they do a ton of good work in a petri dish, it's very hard for them to behave appropriately in the body because yeah. it can affect people differently. A lot of times, if you take these probiotics, you can actually add a little gasoline to the fire, so to speak, to yeah. make it worse. So, with that, with that being knowledge, with, with that kind of knowledge, then um, there's a company called uh, Megaspore Biotic. Yeah. Megaspore Biotic, which I. I got some samples, I'm looking at it, but the science is really cool, and they've yeah. got some great data. Basically, the bacteria are, <laughs> they, um, I was joking around with them, I'm like, well, how do you get them to go, to basically go to sleep? Um, they get these bacteria, and they stress them so that they have an, uh, a mechanism where they turn into a spore, and that spore will survive the GI tract until it gets to the colon, and then at that point, they'll wake up and start helping out. So yeah. that's another great trick and another um, great idea about, okay, how do we continue to learn more? We know these bacteria are good for us, but they're not making it to the colon. Here's a way that we can do that. So I'm going to be working with him closely. We may even be doing some research together. Uh, that's the other big thing is I want to do, uh, I'm trying to get my company, Digestive Health Associates of Texas. Yeah. We have a large research division. I've been bugging our, um, I've been bugging the head of research now for about a month. I said, we really have to start doing uh, functional research. I want to start doing natural things, putting them through the same rigorous uh, channels that all these drugs do. Yeah. But of course, the answer is that you know it's very hard to make money on something you can't patent. But I'm like, man, we should just do this anyways. Let's be the let's be the Whole Foods of the gastrointestinal world, yeah. where we really yeah. start moving the needle on that. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, so a couple other questions about a trantil. Um, so. Do you use it mainly for methane, or can someone benefit if they have more of diarrhea type symptoms? That's a great question. So when we initially did the clinical trials, we looked at only people with constipation. Since we've launched, we've launched um, around two and a half years ago. We've had um, I treat a lot of people with diarrhea as well. We've learned that it actually works in the same mechanism. Yeah. Um, the it does have antimicrobial properties, and what we're able to do is clear off the bacteria which produce the hydrogen, which ultimately leads to hydrogen sulfide. So yeah. we have had um, success treating all types of SIBO as well. Cool. Awesome. Good to know. Um, and then as far as, like, I imagine there's not, not much risk, right, to taking the product. It's a natural product. Um, if someone wants to, you know, see if they can benefit them and help their symptoms. Yeah. So we've um, treated, well, we've been, we did the clinical trials and now we've been out for two and a half years and we've, treated hundreds of thousands of people that um, have done really well with it. The What we have seen that these are natural food products that are recognized as food by the FDA. Yeah. So these are the polyphenols that we're talking about. I personally and just about all my staff and everybody at the company, 
Um, I like to live the lifestyle that I that I'll have my patients do. So yeah. I've been taking it since we had the first prototypes of it yeah. three times a day, and I've been on it for five years now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, no. So fortunately, we have not seen any major side effects. Some people um, can have some issues with some uh, die off reactions, or possibly even that shift from that diarrhea yeah. to constipation. And that's you know we fully we fully accept that 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 there's going to be changes. We, we I believe that we're going to continue to modify this till eventually we'll have a combination of optrantil plus something else, or change the molecular structure a little yeah. bit the the ratio. So we'll dial it in a little bit more. But yeah, generally speaking, most people have had very positive results and. They end up staying on it because of the different things that we talked about. The postbiotics leading to anti-aging effect, leading yeah. to uh, anti-inflammatory. So That's super cool. So, I mean, people can benefit from consistent use of it, basically. That's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah so we've had almost everybody that's ever taken it will take a round of it, feel better, and they realize they just continue to feel better. So yeah. we'll just take it as a overall digestive supplement. So they okay. take it every day like they would a multivitamin or anything yeah. else. Yeah. Awesome. So, and then, um, if anyone in the audience wants to check it out, um, you can go to love my tummy slash SIBO survivor. Um, I know you guys, you guys are pretty much, you're on Amazon probably, right? You have your own site. Um, in a lot of yeah, stores. Have, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have our own site. So I think that uh, I think for you it'd be lovemytummy.com forward slash SIBO Survivor. Yeah. And you can go to Optron Teal or go to KBMD. That's uh that's my website. Um Optron Teal is A T R A N T I L dot com. Yeah. But I would prefer everybody just to go to lovemytummy.com forward slash SIBO Survivor because that way it'd be more relevant to what we're talking about. So. Yeah, definitely. Well uh Thanks so much for coming on the show, and um, I think this is some great information. It'll probably help a lot of people out. And you know, if anyone wants to try out a Trontil for relief, um, it seems like an amazing product. And um, I just, yeah, just thanks so much for your time. And I'm sure everyone really enjoy will really enjoy this. <laughs> well, no, um, honestly, thank you. Thank you for being somebody who went through a difficult time and you're willing to share it with everybody because this just brings up the discussions that I want to have with people. It, it exists. They can go to you. They can realize that you're very honest about it, that you suffered from it. And, you know, now you've made it your life's mission to help yeah. other people. I think that's awesome. I honor your journey. Thanks. Yeah. I just, it, like you said, it's something I'm just super passionate about now, right? When it affects your life that much. So, all right. Awesome. Thanks so much. Ken. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate right. it.